So C tilde um, such that C tilde at T is the limit as I goes to infinity of C I of T. And then just because it's a, a limit on the subgroups, it'll also be a limit. And so it'll give you what you expect. What is these for? Uh, this is, there was a question, uh, if you just joined, uh, the question was in this theorem, in this proof of this theorem for property T, mm -hmm. uh, I made one claim, which uh, now it's a little unclear, but I don't actually need it. So what we did is we took the one space of one co-cycles and we embedded it into H direct sum H in this way. And then to, uh, to use the proof, we need to we're, want to claim that there's no almost invariant co-cycles, that every co-cycle is almost inner. And so what we did was we showed that if you're orthogonal to the inners, then you had to be zero. But that, all, that proof only works if you have a closed subspace. So then there was the question of how do you prove that this subspace is a closed subspace of here? And there's also, I claimed continuity, but actually continuity of this embedding we didn't need. We just needed that the topology on the right was stronger than almost invariance, right? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I understand that step, but I don't see why C tilde, uh, the vectors, uh, cross, the vector corresponding to C tilde e is equal to the original two vectors. Uh, that's just because uh, C tilde uh, on some sigma, say sigma one, some sigma one and sigma one, this is on one hand the limit uh, of CI of sigma one. Um, and this we know is the limit of C uh, sigma one, sorry, the notation is terrible, but this is, I'm creating the notation off on the fly. So, uh, C, oh, here I am. C I sigma one I, which is C sigma one minus pi sigma one C sigma one. Right. So this limit is given by this inner vector on the two subgroups. Oh. So what we have is that this embedding I've given by Z1, uh, so certainly this is a closed subspace, and we have that the topology on this subspace uh, um, implies the the, uh, the pointwise convergence. So we, we certainly have that the topology on H direct sum H implies pointwise convergence. Oh, so we are using the uniqueness of Z. Uh, yes. Okay, oh, I see, thank you. So I agree the converse of this uh, statement that pointwise convergence implies that it converges in this topology on H direct sum H, that seems a little unclear to me. Um, but we don't actually use it for the proof. You know, all we use is that it's a stronger topology. And so therefore, if we get something, if we prove everything orthogonal to the inners is zero, then that's saying that, uh, again, the inners are dense and hence they're also dense in this weaker topology, which is what we actually want. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions before we delve into the next section? Okay, so that was, uh, that's about all I wanted to say about property T. Uh, let's see, when we finished amenability, I gave an open problem with amenability, so let me maybe give an open problem with property T. Uh, how about, here's an open problem. Uh, open. And that is, do uh, some 
infinite Burnside groups. Have property T. Uh, that's an open problem, which would be interesting uh, to to know what to do with there. Um, yeah, so Shalom was certainly interested in this problem because there's a, a question of a, a big open problem in group theory, which is about finitely presented Burnside groups. And so there, of course, um, you yeah. know, so there was some question about that. So that, there's an open problem that you can think about. I know almost nothing about this open problem. I just have heard that it's an open problem. I have not thought about it myself. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to a new section. So what I want to talk about now is kind of the extreme opposite of property T, uh, which is Hagrup's property. So what is Hagrup's property? Oh, I see, I left my notes over here. All right, uh, so let me give you a definition and then we'll discuss it in its relationship to property T and other properties such as amenability. So here's the definition, which is that uh, first a definition for representations a unitary representation pi from gamma to mu of h is a mixing if the matrix coefficients are c0 functions. So if for all c and eta and h, um, we map taking elements in gamma and taking them to, this is called the matrix coefficient. It's called that because if you have a, if H is finite dimensional, then you can view B of H as matrices. And this is exactly the coefficient of the matrix when you put in the standard basis here. Uh, so you want that this function is in C0 of gamma. Uh, so of course, if gamma is finite, maybe this isn't such a good definition. So let me only define it for, say, gamma and infinite group. Gamma. And so if you have an infinite group and you have a unitary representation, then we'll say that the unitary representation is mixing if these matrix coefficients uh, vanish at infinity. So they all give you C0 functions of the group gamma. Uh, so the most natural example, again here, if gamma is infinite, so then L2 of gamma, the left regular representation, um, so then the left regular representation, mapping gamma to the entire group of L2 of gamma uh, is mixing. Right, that's easy enough to check. Uh, one other example, and this is uh, comes from the proof we saw for the char different characterizations of property T, and that is that if we have that phi mapping gamma to the complex numbers is of positive type, positive type, and if phi is in C0 of gamma, so if phi vanishes at infinity, uh, by the way, C0 of gamma, this is terminology. Um, if you haven't seen this before, let me just define this for you. This is equal uh, to the set of functions mapping gamma to the complex numbers such that for all epsilon greater than zero, 
um, uh, the set of T and gamma such that absolute value of F of T is greater than epsilon, this should be a finite set, is finite. So you can get arbitrarily small off of a finite uh, off of a finite set. So that's what C0 of a function is, um, or any set, C0 is that. And if phi is a C0 posit uh, positive type function, so then the GNS construction, GNS representation is mixing. Uh, we basically saw this in our proof uh, of the characterizations of property T. Uh, all you have to note is uh, note that for all say X and Y in gamma, the function that takes T to the inner product of uh, pi T. And remember, uh, so the GNS representation, you had a pi and then you had a cyclic vector. And so if you put in pi X C, pi Y C, well, this is just equal to phi of X T, uh, I guess Y inverse T X. And what do we know? We know that this function goes to zero as t goes to infinity because this phi is a C0 function. But that means that all of these matrix coefficients are C0 functions. And of course, now you could take spans of matrix coefficients like this. And then again, the spans are dense. And so then you can pass to the closure to get that all matrix coefficients are C0 functions. So whenever you have a C0 positive definite function, the corresponding GNS representation is mixing. This is one natural way to get them. Uh, okay. So now let me give a definition slash theorem. Slash definition. That gamma has the Hegar property. if the following equivalent conditions hold. And the first is that um, there exists a mixing representation with almost invariant vectors. So there is a mixing representation with almost invariant vectors. I guess here again, a gamma will be an infinite group, uh, but we'll say finite groups have the Hegar property too. That's fine. But for the theorem, it'll be only infinite groups. Uh, there's a mixing representation with almost invariant vectors. Two, uh, we can find a pointwise approximation of the identity with positive type functions, which are C0. There are C0 positive type functions. Phi such that Phi converges to one pointwise. Three, there exists a proper co-cycle. There is some representation pi and a proper co-cycle C. Uh, proper here means that this function, uh, it's kind of the opposite of C0. It means it tends to infinity as you go to infinity in the group. So it means uh, that for every C greater than zero, um, the set of T in the group C, such that the norm of C of T is less than uh, C is fine. So outside of a finite set, you're as large as possible. So that's a proper co-cycle. Um, four, uh, 
the same as three, uh, but the representation uh, is mixing. So you have a mixing representation with the proper co-cycle. Uh, five, there is a proper conditionally negative type function. There is a proper uh, conditionally negative type function. All right. Uh, so this is the theorem slash definition. Um, so, and then the proof is uh, same as before, same as for property T. All right, so this is cheating a bit. Uh, there are a couple maybe hiccups that uh, come into play when you go through the same proof. But these are minor things which everyone here, if you're told, look at the proof of property T and prove that it gives you these equivalences for the Hager property, uh, you should be able to do. Uh, if you remember each step, so if we had a, a mixing representation with almost invariant vectors, well, we had a correspondence between almost invariant vectors and positive type functions. And so a sequence of almost invariant vectors gives you these positive type functions. Conversely, if you have these positive type functions, then you get almost invariant vectors in a direct sum and direct sums of mixing representations is mixing. So you can go from two to one in that way. Um, uh, also, we know that uh, five and three are the same because we know that a proper co-cycle gives you a proper conditionally negative type function. The norm squared gives it to you. And conversely, if you have a proper conditionally negative type function, then it comes from a proper co-cycle. So five and three are the same. Uh, and four obviously implies both of those. And then we also have Schoenberg's theorem, which shows that uh, five implies two, or three implies two. If you have a proper, uh, proper co-cycle, or a proper conditionally negative type function, then exponentiating it gives you this family of positive type functions. And you notice that, uh, so note C, uh, proper conditionally negative type. So this implies that uh, the exponential of negative T times C is C0 and positive type. So therefore, Schoenberg's theorem gives you this uh, family of C0 and positive type functions, which converge pointwise to the identity. Uh, and then the only thing left to check is uh, two imply or one implies four. And this was uh, how we started with the sequence of vectors. So maybe I'll briefly uh, outline one implies four. I have one question. Uh, yeah. What is exactly the difference between one and four? Is it, um, I mean, between, I mean between... Oh, what's the difference between three and four, you mean? Uh, oh, no, 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 never mind. I, I understand what I... Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, so I already outlined just in words, the equivalence of one and two, and that's exactly the same as property T. Similarly, the equivalence of three and four is exactly the same as property T, and four certainly implies both of those. Uh, and, uh, and then I just showed you how uh, three, or yeah, three implies two. Three implies two and one. So the only thing I haven't shown you so far, or just described for you, is, uh, is how you get from one to four. And this is exactly what we did before in the group and the, in the property T case, but maybe you have to be slightly more careful. So if we have, um, if uh, we have some H, uh, or if we have pi representation,
a representation uh, which is C0, our mixing representation. So you'll also see these called C0 representations or mixing representation. So the, mix, the terminology mixing comes from ergodic theory. So there's a notion of a mixing action. And if you have a measure preserving mixing action, then the Koopman representation will be mixing uh, representation. Uh, if pi is a mixing representation um, with almost invariant vectors. And then again, you take, we'll do exactly what we did before. So we take C i, C n. So again, this is all I should say countable, uh, gamma countably infinite. Uh, I'm only going to be caring about countably infinite groups, although if you want to go to uncountable groups, uh, there's probably a way to adapt all of these characterizations. But the proof I'll give here, again, I'll use some sequence so that I can use restricted countable. Uh, so let's take Xn, uh, almost invariant. Uh, we enumerate gamma as a T uh, K and choose a subsequence of the CNs such that uh, T uh, K of I of T K C N minus C N. So this should always be, uh, say, less than, uh, I don't know, 1 over 2 to the n for k less than or equal to n. So we can choose a subsequence such that this holds. And then again, you consider the cocycle C mapping gamma to h. And this is by C of t is going to be the sum uh, maybe want a direct sum H probably doesn't matter here. So we'll take a direct sum, an infinite direct sum of H. So notice that this is still mixing. And then, then we take this to be the infinite direct sum of like CN of say two, maybe change this to four to the N, change this to two to the N of Cn minus pi to Cn. And then just as we showed before, this convert this sum converges. So we get a genuine cocycle. Uh, so we get a cocycle. And then the thing to notice is just that the norm of this cocycle. So then if we want to look at the limit as t goes to infinity of the norm of the C of t. Well, then what can we do here? This is certainly, say, squared. This is certainly greater than or equal to. We just project onto our favorite copy. So this is greater than or equal to the limit as t goes to infinity of 2 to the n, uh, I guess, squared times Cn minus pi t cn squared. But now if you look at what, what is the norm of this vector, when you square it out, you see that this is, you're going to get a, well, the usual inequality we've done, we're going to get, it's a unitary, so it's going to be twice the norm of cn squared minus twice the real part of pi t cn cn. And now we, we have here this coefficient, and this is a C0 function. So when we take a limit as t goes to infinity, and these are unit vectors, so that's just one. So if we take a limit as t goes to infinity, uh, this is equal to, I guess, 2 to the 2n times 2. Right, so we know that the limit as t goes to infinity of the cocycle squared is greater than or equal to uh, 2 to the 2n times 2, and that's for every n. Right, so therefore we know that this is, can get arbitrarily large. Right, so we get therefore c is a proper cocycle. All right, 
So we see exactly where we used mixingness of the representation to get that this co-cycle is proper. Okay, any questions about that? So that's the Hager property. So you see that it's, it's somewhat analogous to property T. Uh, in fact, notice that property T says that whenever you had a representation with almost invariant vectors, then you had fixed vectors. Uh, so Hager property says you have a mixing representation with almost invariant vectors. And of course, if you're an infinite group uh, and you have a mixing representation, then it clearly doesn't have any invariant vectors because invariant vectors, the corresponding matrix coefficient would be constant. Right? So clearly property T intersect Hager property, you get finite groups again, just like immutable groups. Uh, and the other thing is, is, of course, amenable groups, we already showed one characterization of them, and that is that the left regular representation has almost invariant vectors. And that's certainly a nice mixing representation. So we have that uh, amen amenable groups implies uh, the Hagerup property. And this, uh, this in Hagerup plus infinite implies not property T. So those are the obvious relations that we have between these two properties uh, so far. So in particular, uh, like SL and Z, in fact, Hagrup actually shows something much more, not only not property T, but in fact, this also implies that no infinite uh, subgroup has relative property T. And that's for exactly the same reason. If you have an invariant vector for an infinite subgroup, then your representation is not mixing, right? So this is just because, uh, so, if uh, pi is mixing and sigma in gamma has an invariant vector, so then uh, sigma is finite. Because otherwise the matrix coefficient corresponding to that invariant vector, well, that's constant on sigma. So C0 says it's, it's finite. Uh, so, so therefore we have examples of groups which are not Hagerup nor property T. So for instance, SL3Z, right? So SL3Z, we know that this has T. We know that SL2Z, semi-direct product uh, Z squared, uh, at this point, we know that it's uh, you know, not Hager up, uh, but it's also not T. Maybe I'll show that because we know that property T passes to quotients and I'll show in a moment that SL2Z has Hager up, so it won't have property T. Uh, so we'll show this, I guess, in just a moment. Uh, the other thing we know is that uh, we have like amenable groups and then we'll show that free groups. Uh, so we'll show now that free groups have Hagerup's property. All right, so that's the next thing that we're going to show. Uh, in fact, we're going to do this uh, with a nice technique uh, introduced by Hagelund and Pauline, and that is uh, the notion of a space with walls. So let me give you a definition here. So definition, so a space with walls. is a set together uh, with partitions uh, into two disjoint non-empty subsets. So the partitions, uh, so we're gonna have 
some collection of partitions. We'll denote that by W. So this is going to be some collections. And for partitions, uh, yeah, some, sometimes you see them as just uh, partitions of subsets. Sometimes you see them as ordered pairs of uh, complementary subsets. Uh, usually it doesn't make a difference. Uh, so these are going to be some collection of some spaces H and their complement. Uh, so these are half spaces. So we have so we have some collection of partitions of X into two disjoint non-empty subsets. So H and H complement, these are subsets that are called the half spaces. The partition themselves are called walls. Uh, and then we need a couple of properties. Uh, one is actually we just need one property and such that that, uh, so we'll say that two points are separated by a wall if one lives in one half space of a partition and the other lives in the other half space of a partition. And then we just, so we say that X, uh, so such that for each X not equal to Y in this X space, X, X is the space we're in. For each two distinct point X and Y and X, um, there are positive, but finally many, walls, pairs H and HC uh, in the space of walls uh, that separate X and Y. X and Y. So IE such that X is an H, Y is an H complement, or X is an H complement and Y is an H. So this is a space with walls. Uh, it's some set and we have a collection of walls on this set, which walls just are partitions into two half spaces and such that for each pair of points, there's some wall which separates them, but only finitely many walls that separate them. All right, if you wanna build some intuition, let me give you some examples here. Uh, so here's the first nice example. And then I think you'll see exactly where the definition came, comes from. Uh, so the example is we consider X to be Z squared. Uh, so we, have write this as a lattice and R squared. Something like this. And we set letter or set walls, so a half space uh, will be say H, which is consider will consider the set of all uh, pairs n and m such that n is say less than or equal to some fixed n naught or so this is yeah or h is set of all points n and m such that m is less than or equal to some m naught or their complements. So these will be the allowable half spaces and then our walls will be the corresponding partitions. So the walls, uh, the corresponding partitions. So what does this mean? This means that if we have some point here, which is say, uh, say this point here is some uh, the first X coordinate is N naught. So then what are we gonna do? We're going to put a wall and we're going to separate all the points such that their X coordinate is less than N naught, less than or equal to N naught, and all the coordinates such that the X coordinate is greater than N naught. So these, this is the wall that we consider here. Or if we have these other types of walls, say maybe this is 
and not in the y direction. So then we separate this into everything less than m naught and everything greater than m naught, less than or equal or greater than. So this is some this is some wall w1 and this other one is some other wall w2 and of course we have all their various ones. So there are infinitely many walls. And what do we notice? We notice from any two points, there is at least one wall separating them because either in the x or the y direction, these points will differ by at least one. So there's a wall that separates them. However, for any two points, there are only finitely many walls that separate them because you have all the walls in the vertical direction, which is just their vertical distance. And then you have the walls in the horizontal direction, which um, is their horizontal distance, or I guess other way around. Verticals, walls separate horizontal distance and the horizontal walls separate the vertical distance. Uh, so this is the stereotypical space with walls. Any questions about that? Here's another example, which is more relevant to us. Although this example is perfectly nice, uh, but we can consider any tree. So T, a simplicial, tr simplicial tree. So that just means we have some graph and we have vertices coming out of the graph and there are no loops. So here's a perfectly nice Uh, it's a, so these are infinite graphs, right? Um, so this is, in this case, what can we do? Well, for each edge, edge, well, because it's a tree, there are no cycles. So if we remove an edge, then we have two connected components of the tree. And we just let those two connected components be the two uh, half spaces for each edge E, uh, we let the two connected components of T take away the edge, uh, well, of T after removing the edge, and this be a wall. So for every edge, we have a wall. So of course, the walls are the vertices of the tree. The walls consist of vertices of the tree. But for each edge, we think of each edge as a wall by just cutting the tree at that edge. And then we have one partition to the left of the wall and one partition to the right of the wall. Right? or we might choose another edge and that gives us another partition. So this is a natural space with walls. And again, if you have any two points, then there's some edge, which of course, which is between them. And so removing that edge, they're in separate connected components. So any two points are separated by at least one wall. But on the other hand, uh, two points are separated by one of these walls if and only if that wall corresponds to an edge connecting the two vertices. So therefore, we have that the number of walls separating two points is exactly their length in the graph. Right? For each edge between the two, two vertices, you get this wall, and uh, those are the only walls that separate two points. Right? So again, this is a very nice space with walls. All right. And then you can imagine certain variations, but these will already suffice for our purposes. Any questions about that? Yes. What do you mean by a simplicial tree? Is that just like a regular tree? Uh, it just means a graph as opposed to like a real tree. Uh, so a simplicial tree just means this is a graph. Uh, it'll be a graph. It's a simplicial graph. A tree. Yeah. So it's a. a 
graph with edges. Uh, wait, what do you mean by a real tree? Like the ones that are outside or? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, those, but also uh, there's uh, also an R tree, maybe I should say real tree. Uh, these are objects oh. where the edges are allowed to have length, which are just... Uh, uh, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> so I just mean a simplicial tree. Okay, so I just mean a graph with edges, so it'll collection of vertices with edges between them, such that there are no cycles. Uh, so of the one I've drawn here, each vertex has you know a three edges, but you could have infinitely many. Uh, that's fine. That's not a problem, and that would still fit in with this space with walls. All right, so the main theorem here is, uh, so uh, the theorem, and that is that if x together with w is, uh, well, first, uh, yeah, is a space with walls, and if d sub w from two points x and y denotes the number of walls separating x and y. So then uh, d sub w is a kernel of negative type. So any space with walls, we get this negative type cone. Uh, all right, so in particular for trees, we know that this number of walls separating them, that's exactly their distance in the graph. So the graph distance for trees is a kernel of negative type. That's a corollary of this. All right, so let's go ahead and prove this. Uh, and it's uh, very easy. So we know that this, uh, we have this course, this GNS type theorem, which says kernels of negative type always come from maps into Hilbert spaces. And so that's the natural thing to look at. And in fact, that's all we need to do is we just define uh, C mapping our set X to a Hilbert space. And the Hilbert space we're going to consider is L2 of the space with walls. Um, and now let me think, to be a little careful, I might want to, this probably doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, for the proof I wrote out in my notes, I think you could do it either way. Uh, but for the proof I wrote out in my notes, uh, it's gonna be, it'll be easier to have walls going in two directions. So. I'll, I won't do L2 of the walls, I'll do L2 of the half spaces. So H, so proof, let H denote the collection of half spaces. So each wall corresponds to two half spaces. So we let H be the collection of half spaces and I'm gonna define a function C from X to this Hilbert space L2 of the space of half spaces. So sorry, we've been using script H for Hilbert spaces, but here it's not a Hilbert space, it's a, a discrete set. Uh, and we define this by setting C of X, this is going to be the characteristic function. Oh, we're gonna fix by fixing some x not in x and defining and setting c of x. This is going to be the characteristic function. And here we're going to say do the set of h half spaces such that um, x is an h but x naught is not an h. 
So these are the walls which separate X and Y, but then I'm going to subtract the characteristic function on the set of H and H such that X is not an H and X not is an H. All right, so this is a perfectly nice, uh, so notice by this, by one of the properties of space with walls, for any X and X naught, there are only finitely many half spaces that separate them, only finitely many walls. So we see that this uh, vector here, this is, has finite support. So it's certainly an L2. And then we just have to check what is uh, CX minus CY, and we want to compute the norm of this squared. And I claim that this is exactly uh, the number of half, the number of walls which separate X and Y. Uh, maybe up to a multiple of two, maybe we get twice the number or something like this. But up to a multiplicative constant, I claim that this is exactly the walls that separate X from Y. And then you can uh, check this. Uh, actually, maybe just a picture for the tree is already very clear. So if we have, uh, for example, that already gives the idea. So if we have here our tree, say we take our tree here, and let's say we take our point uh, x naught right here, and maybe we have x here, and maybe we have y over here. So then what's going to happen, uh, what, C does is C gives you, so here we, we are doing with half spaces. So we'll think of half spaces. Now these are oriented edges as opposed to walls, which were non-oriented edges. And so what are we doing here? Well, for X, we add a plus one for every half space where X is contained in that. So we can think of these as kind of doing plus one for each of these edges. And then we do a minus one for each of the edges going in reverse. So we do a minus one for each of these edges going in reverse. So that's what C of X is. It's just the characteristic function on these blue minus the characteristic function on these orange. And then you see what's going on with Y. Well, when we, Y will be the same picture, but when we now take these, when we subtract Y, now we're going to get the characteristic function on things going away from um, x. So we're going to add a 1 to there, 1 to there, 1 to there. And we're going to subtract that one, that one, and that one. And then you see what happens is that we have this triple point in the middle here. And everything going from the triple point to x naught will get canceled. And then when that's when le what's left over is that we get exactly the edges going from X to Y minus the edges going from Y to X. And that's exactly what we'll see in general here. If we look at this function and we compute it, we see that this function, uh, this will exactly be the characteristic function of half spaces such that X is an H and Y is not an H, minus the characteristic function on half spaces, such that Y is an H and X is not an H. The same picture works uh, in general. That, uh, you know, we see that if a half space separates X from Y and it separates or sorry, if it separates X from X naught and it separates Y from X naught, then it'll get canceled when we take the difference here. One question. In yeah. this case, it would be zero, right? In the case of for the, for the, the tree. I uh, know for what I've written here. So this is X naught, this is X and Y. So when I look at the difference of these two vectors, I get exactly the characteristic function from X to Y minus the characteristic function of the edges from Y to X. I mean, I, but in, in our case, aren't those two sets the same? 
uh, are what two sets the same. So C is a function on X and Y. It's this function on the tree in this case. Mm -hmm. And we see that in this case, this C of X minus C of Y, the norm squared, what is it? In this case, it's uh, their distance is four. So the norm squared is gonna be, well, I guess we have two, so it's four plus four. And in general, that's exactly what we see here. We see that C of X minus C of Y squared is exactly going to be, uh, I guess we have the number of half spaces that separate them here, but then we have another copy here. So it's gonna be twice uh, this D sub W of X and Y that I wrote down. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that proves the theorem because the theorem just said that this function is conditionally negative type and here we've written it explicitly as a function we already know is conditionally negative type. So the corollary of this, the corollary is that if uh, gamma, a group acts properly on a space with walls, So again, properly, it's the same as we've seen before. So properly here just means that um, uh, for all uh, x in x, or for all for sum, it doesn't matter, uh, for all x in x, the set of all t and gamma such that the distance from tx to x is finite, is less than some bound, uh, this is finite. So this is also for all n. All right, this is what properness means. So it just means that you move things, or another way to say this is that the limit, i.e. the limit as t goes to infinity of the distance between tx and t and x, this is infinite. And that's another way to write this more compactly. That as you go far away out in the group, the distance from your x uh, to t of x uh, gets larger and larger, this wall distance. So the corollary is that if gamma acts properly on a space with walls, uh, so then gamma has a Hager property. And why is that? That's because, well, here we have a condition of negative, uh, negative type. Uh, so when I say an action on a space of walls, I mean implicitly that it preserves the wall structure. So if the action preserves the wall structure. Uh, and so if you have a proper action on the space of walls, then you get this conditionally negative type function where you preserve the wall structure. So you preserve the difference, the distance. And so this then gives you, uh, like we saw before, it gives you a co-cycle on the group and this will be proper because of this properness here. So specifically, uh, we get a conditionally negative type function on gamma by um, T it's sent to this wall distance from t applied to x naught, x naught. And this is for any fixed x naught. For any fixed x naught, this gives us a conditionally negative type function. And the properness condition exactly says that this will be a proper conditional ne negative type function. So that was what we get. Uh, so one example, so uh, you know, we can give one first example now, and that is that free groups, say Fn, uh, n greater than equal to one, uh, have Hagerup's property.
And why is that? That's because they act on their Cayley graph properly, and that Cayley graph is a tree. So they act on, act on trees. Um, in fact, what we see here is, um, yeah, any, I guess, uh, yeah. Uh, we also get things like, uh, say, z mod 2z, free product z mod 2z, free product z mod 2z. Well, that acts on the tri, uh, on this tree up here that I've written. There's the Cayley graph of that tree uh, or of that group. And so that you have that this group also has head group property. Um, you know. And more generally, you can push these types of gain to games to show that in fact, any free product of amenable groups will have had a property. So I won't prove that in full detail, but you can imagine how that goes. In fact, any free product of Hegra groups has the Hegra property. So we won't prove that in that generality, but we've already established free groups by this, by, by this method. So that's enough for our purposes. Uh, all right, so here's a good point to stop. Are there any questions before I go? Uh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. When you say that the group action preserves the work structure, does that mean that any hot image of the group of element, any image of the hot space is also in W? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. So when I say that it acts on, this, on, the space of, on the space with walls, I mean that it acts on the set and that this action preserves the space of half spaces. So in particular, it will also preserve the distance Thank you. Sure. Other questions? All right, great. I'll go ahead and stop here and I